Please don't. Hi, Miss Landa. Hi. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Let's take your hymnals, turn to page 679. Page six said me now. Let's stand to sing all four verses this evening. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know that saith the If you pray for us this evening, brother. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. It's good to have our visitors with us. Sister Tabitha, sister. And, uh, good to have Brother Jeremiah with us tonight. Just uh, good to have the Tillmans back. Been off out of town, love burden for the anniversary. Said they had a good trip, all but a all but a tire blowout. I guess that's better than the engine blowing out, isn't it? 
We missed y'all, though. Glad y'all had a safe trip and glad you made it back, back okay and all. All right. Uh, just a couple of things as far as announcements. Of course, uh, so, um, it, this, I know it's kind of awkward with the rain. Maybe it'll stop for the service over. But after church tonight, if we can, let's get some together and go out there and get the tables in the gym and kind of set up the tables. And I, I don't know about the chairs yet. It'd be my first time being out there doing something like this. I don't know if there's chairs out there or if we take chairs from in here. But if we can just kind of get some of the tables set up and kind of part of the way ready for Sunday night, uh, if, we can, if we can get a few volunteers to help, that'd be wonderful. Um, of course, we've got Sunday morning, Sunday school, 10 o'clock, Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, and then this Sunday night at 5 o'clock for be the 3rd of July. We're having a little patriotic theme, kind of just a family day, family, you know, play some games, have some hot dogs and hamburgers, just a good time of fellowship and, and all. So I'm looking forward to that, and then that'll be a kickoff for meeting back together on Sunday nights and then uh, starting off for the 10th Sunday night service at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Getting, we'll be back started on that on a regular basis. Uh, before we sing another song, we'll do a prayer list at the end of the service, but our missionary of the week is James and Mary Ray. Uh, they're international missions representatives with BIMI. And of course, they're, he's originally out of this church. And um, But I've, he, his prayer letter today, and I don't know if this is actually his prayer letter. I guess it is. Or if it's just a little update, but you know, how many of y'all are familiar with Tennessee Temple University? Well, y'all know that, uh, I'm going to have to cheat and look at the paper. I've said in Highland Park, I said that name of that church, I don't know how many times through my life, but y'all know it burned a couple weeks ago. And uh, he sent a picture, apparently he was, went by Highland Park, well he's with BIMI, so he probably lives pretty close to there. But he sent a picture of the front of the church building, this, this brick, but it's just caved in, just looks terrible. And, um, but he went to Bible college there, and of course, well, let me just read the letter. It explains some of it. <clears throat> but he says, he says, I took this picture of Highland Park Baptist Church the day after the fire. Gene Payne surrendered to preach under the ministry of Dr. Lee Robertson, and I, and I under the ministry of Gene Payne. So he's a second generation under Dr. Lee Robertson preacher. It's kind of interesting. Mary and I felt an incredible sense of sadness seeing what was left of the building. We met there, fell in love there, and it was there that we were prepared. Good evening. How y'all doing this evening? Good. Uh, we, we met there, fell in love there, and it was there that we prepared for the gospel ministry. Ironically, the doors, all that were left, remain open. And in the picture, you can kind of see that. The door frame's open, and he kind of played off that. He said they remained open. He says those doors were open to thousands of people who received the Savior during the ministry of Dr. Lee Robertson and Dr. J. J. R. Faulkner. Because those doors were open, Dr. Robertson and Dr. Faulkner, along with, with other great men, started Baptist International Missions Incorporated, which we call BIMI. Uh, through the ministry of BIMI, hundreds of missionaries have taken the gospel around the world. Those doors are still open around the world through thousands of churches started by BIMI missionaries. Since the days of Dr. Lee Robinson, the building had been sold and was uh, in use by another group, but that is where it all started. God is still on the move. He is not in bondage to buildings. We had a great candidate school. Mary and I both had the honor of teaching the new candidates. And this, uh, if anybody doesn't know, that's candidates for new missionaries for BIMI. It says, pray for meetings that we have, have scheduled this summer. We are trusting the Lord of the harvest will call others to go. Thank you for supporting Mary and me as international representatives of the Bible ministry in BIMI. We thank God for you. Uh, we are yours for the harvest, uh, the Rays, James and Mary Ray. So that's our missionary of the month. Try to remember to pray for the Rays if you would. Let's turn the hymnals to page 536. And I didn't, one, page 531, I'm sorry. 531, I said 536 early, I'm sorry. Far away in the desert. 
depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song in celestial light strains and uneasingly falls on my soul I can Before we get to the prayer list, I'll give you an update um, on Bradley. The Hopefully he was going to get to go home today, not, not home, but out of the hospital. He had a little bit of a setback, the place that's giving him the problem. Um, they found some more issues there and had to go back and kind of redo some things, I guess is the best way to say it, yesterday. And as far as I know, that all went well, and they were trying to let him out. But he's got, and, and we'll talk about this more in a little while, but there's a lot of things that got to fall right in place. Brother Bryant, did, I don't know where that came from. Brother Bryant said today, it sounded like uh, alfalfa. Uh, Brother Bryant told me today, he said today he's got to really, um, his faith will be put to the test. There's so many things that's got to work out for him to get back to the place where he stay in the work site for him to, to get stay there and so forth. We'll talk about it a little bit more this afternoon, but that's Brother Bryant. Hopefully he'll be back. Um, they'll be flying back in from Alaska and be back Sunday morning. Y'all have to hear me all day long Sunday again. But uh, anyway, take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Praise the Lord for the rain. We have had the rain, haven't we? We needed the rain. Of course, we've got to be careful not to complain about it. We was just this time last week about to burn up and die, well, a little week and a half ago, and all those 95, 98, and 102 degree days, and sure hope we can get some rain. So now that we got the rain, we can't don't need to complain about the rain, do we? 
All right, Hebrews chapter 12. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redo what I started in Sunday school, Sunday morning. I kind of got it introduced, and I went over to Rome. It's not a time Rome. I'm not going to go there tonight and do that. That way I'm going to just simplify it down and get right to the points of it. Um, of the message. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also... We also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Um, I just want to focus on that part where it says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And we talked about it a little bit Sunday morning, but there's some things that are weights that slow us down but aren't necessarily sin. And sometimes some things are, compl- are, you know, very black and white in the scriptures, and some we may say are a, a gray area, just, you know, is it right to do this? Is it right to go there to, to say this? Or, uh, you know, is it right to do this thing, or is it not right to do this thing? And there's not necessarily a verse that plainly outlines it, but there's Bible principles. Would not I give you a few things that... Uh, that when we put whatever the thing is you're considering, that we put it to a test of scriptures, and we ought to have a clear conscience of whether we should or should not do those things. I, I just title it the weight and sin test. So let's go ahead and let's have a word of prayer. Father, help us tonight. Help me as I preach tonight. Lord, uh, there might be someone here tonight that's in the middle of a, of a dilemma in their life, Lord, and they're just not sure of something. But Lord, I know probably every day in our life there's things that come about, decisions we need to make. And Lord, we know that you're real clear about some things that you'd have a child of God to stay away from. And then some things, Lord, we're just not sure. And God, I pray that you'd help us to apply these principles from the Scripture. Lord, that we'd have peace in our lives every day in the things we partake of that we, or that we reject in our lives. But God, above all, have us to, have, help us to have a sweet spirit and the things that we do with peace in our hearts. God, we love you. I pray that you'd help me to preach truth, that we'd get help from the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Happens to the best of us, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. All right, just looking here at the text, and, and I, I love the book of Hebrews, challenging book, but that chapter 12 is so hard for me not to uh, just jump in there and, start just going verse by verse those next few verses there but I'm not going to do that and I'm going to try to stick my my points there but I I do want to say that you know that it talks about a race running this race uh, let us run a race with patience the race is set before us and and I think about it in race and I'm a I hadn't watched NASCAR in a lot of years now I used to be a huge NASCAR fan um and uh I remember back years ago that, and this has always been the case in any kind of race, and this is the case. Any of you fellas, or might be some ladies here, that's raced. And but uh, if you've ever been around a race of any kind, you've got a rule book, and you, you know, you got to have so many cubic inches, your car can't weigh but so much. And and there's things that are set rules, but the team that wins is often the team that's found something that's not against the rules, but it gives them an advantage. And, and I think some of y'all, I, this is a guy reference here, but old Billy Elliott back when he was lapping the field, winning races, just tearing him Chevrolets all to pieces back then. I was a Ford fan back then. But, but uh, anyway, back in those days, uh, you know, what it ended up being is he had his valves in his head was about that big round. wasn't a rule against it. They were just big old huge intake and exhaust valves. And they said, well, we can't let him outrun everybody, so we'll make a rule and size, set a size limit on that and kind of made all the cars go about the same speed. And, of course, They've got them all. But any type of racing's always been that way. Uh, any kind of competition's been that way. There's always people who's going to push the envelope, find something they're going to get as close to the rule book as they can get. But when you can find something that's not against the rules, but it gives you an advantage in racing, well, that's why you race. You know, you want to you want to win. In the Christian life, there's a lot of things that are clearly outlined. I mean, the Ten Commandments gives us a handful of things, but there's so many things that we know are just things that we, we shouldn't do. I mean, we shouldn't lie to each other. We shouldn't talk ugly and uh, use ugly words, or, you know, we shouldn't go up to somebody and just punch them in the face. Or I mean, just you know, there's a lot of things we just know we're not supposed to do, but a lot of times in life there's little things that just, uh, you wonder, should I partake of this, partake of that, whatever it might be. 
wear this, wear this, go, wear this, go, wear that, go somewhere, not go somewhere, hang around with so-and-so. I mean, there's a lot of things that the Bible's just not real clear about. But I think if we're walking with the Lord and we love his word, I think we'll have peace most times whether we should or shouldn't do something. But I'll give you a few, few things tonight, <clears throat> and it all comes first from 1 Corinthians, one of them's in 2 Corinthians, but we'll kind of start at the beginning. Go, to, go with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is just really basic stuff, nothing deep here tonight, but, but boy, it's a, it's a pretty hard test. You know, last Wednesday night I preached about God's test. But there's a little test of conscience, soul, spirit, ever how you would say that, that well, if we consider these things, we ought to have real clear answer. And, and uh, Lord, I, I believe the Lord will speak to us through his word of things that we're considered doing or not doing or whatever, for whatever the case might be. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 and 17, verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, let uh, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we know as Christians, we are temples of the Holy Spirit of God. He dwells in us. We're, we're therefore temples. Uh, well, this first, this first one's so simple, don't miss it. But it's simply this, will this defile whatever this thing that you're considering doing, uh, something you're consider, considering partaking of, whether it be a, a food, a beverage, or somewhere going, or what, there's so many things in life that, uh, that we, we just have to want to be clear and want to be pleased to the Lord. But, but number one, real simply, will it defile the temple of God? You know, I think about, uh, you know, and the word defile just means to, to make something unclean or impure. And I, I think about it in church, and I'm a little bit old-fashioned about a lot of things, but, but in church, uh, you know, and this church is set up where the fellowship hall is actually a separated building, and uh, it's kind of a neat story how the glass foyer got stuck in the middle between the two. But, but uh, anyway, it's... Um, so food's typically not around this and all. You know, some churches, they're just literally outside a door into that. But uh, wherever, I've, wherever I've pastored before and, and been a member before, I wouldn't be the one saying it, but when I've pastored, if we were having fellowship, a lot of times I'd say, now, folks, this is the, this is the sanctuary. We ought not bring food and things in here. And if we're having fellowship, I might announce that we'd let's try to keep our, our food and drinks and all that stuff back there in the Fellowship Paul not bring it into the sanctuary. Now, is that so old-fashioned? Ain't nobody else heard, heard of that before, or y'all understand what I'm saying? I mean, you just didn't, uh, not, I, I mean, I don't want to get on a bandwagon here, but a lot of these modern churches got coffee bars and all that, and there's probably folks come in, I, I don't know, they might be bringing biscuits in, sitting around in church, but I just believe we ought not be bringing food in sanctuary, and I'm just, I'm saying all that for a type, for a picture that would understand we would go to great lengths. I mean, I, let, me, let me simplify it here. Well, if it was raining and we didn't have pavement out front, there's big old mud, mud puddles out there, surely nobody would dare even think about walking in the house of God with mud all over the shoes and trampling mud all into the temple, into the house of God, into the sanctuary. So put that to the test and think about, will it defile the temple if it's something you're considering doing? Well, there's a simple test right there. We're temples of God. Would we, would we do that thing and would we defile the temple, the temple of God, which we are? Well, that's simple enough. Let's move on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Kind of the same, real similar sub subject. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Lord, I mean of the Holy Ghost, excuse me, which is in you, which ye have, have of God, and ye are not your own. Okay, boy, this second one's kind of redundant. The, the first one is, well, if, if it's something you're considering doing, you'd ask yourself, well, would you, would you come do it in the house of God? Would you do it in the temple? Would you defile the temple? And if it's something you wouldn't want to, that would defile the temple, you surely wouldn't don't want to do it. Well, the second thought there in, in verse 19, it, it says, uh, 
and it says the, temp, the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. So this thing that you're considering doing, can you do this knowing that the Holy Ghost lives inside you? First, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says that that good thing which was uh, committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And, and we know and understand when the person gets saved and gets born again, uh, that the Holy Spirit of God takes up a bold and we always have the Spirit of God living in us and he puts him in us and he puts us in him and, and, and salvation is just pretty amazing, isn't it? I think about uh, me and I, you know, I'm 58 years old, that's younger than some of you and a lot older than some of you. But I know in my lifetime, and it wasn't too long ago that you just didn't hear men talk ugly, particularly in front of women or in public. And now, man, you'll see little old kids. You would be, I've written up kindergartners for saying words that I wouldn't even begin to tell you what they start with on the school bus. I mean, good language and bad languages, that line's got real blurry now. Freedom of speech, I don't think ever meant that you could just say anything you wanted to in public in the presence of people. But I'm just trying to say that used to it, it's kind of a thing. A man might not, he might talk ugly around the men, but he wouldn't dare talk ugly around his wife, around his, like his mama particularly, or other ladies. And I'm not saying that's right. Christian ought not ever talk ugly. But I'm just saying for some, it was a, a standard you didn't. Well, I'm just trying to say, would you do this thing knowing that the Holy Ghost lives within you? I'm just trying to apply, say that principle that sometimes people think it's all right to, to talk around some ugly in front of some people, but not others. But man, we got the Holy Spirit, the sweet, the third person of the Trinity, the sweet Holy Spirit of God dwells in us if you're born again. So think about do we want to partake of whatever it is that we're con contemplating? Is it something that you think would just be all right to share with Jesus? We'll share with the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. Well, that's pretty convicting, isn't it? The outwardly looking at it as the temple. Do you want to defile the temple? Number two, would you feel comfortable doing that with the Holy Ghost? Uh, can you do it knowing the Holy Ghost lives inside you? First Corinthians chapter, you're at, you're at First Corinthians chapter 6, 19. Look at the last, excuse me just a second. I'm trying to get better when I have to cough. Um, Brother Justin, where you at there? I see you behind that chandelier. And I... Uh, or, or in the glare of the chandelier. And when I have to cough, not to scare you all to death. So, excuse me, hear me. Let me, let me, let me. <coughs> excuse me. Now you got to come down here and fix my microphone. Uh, 19, verse 19, where we're just at, verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. The last part it says, and you're not your own. You know, that's probably. A big old huge percent of the problems we have as Christians and the issues we deal with in life is because we don't get a hold of that verse right there. We're not our own. We're, we're bought with a price. Verse 20 says, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Um, wow, that's, that's, that's huge right there. It's so simple but so huge. A lot of times we just we think we're... You know, we live in a rights society, a rights-oriented society. By the way, Laodicea Church, the word Laodicea comes from rights of the people and some of the background meaning of that word. And we live in a society where just do If you think it's right, you do it. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And, and boy, we're seeing that with the uh, decision of the Supreme Court last week. Boy, we're split, and I've seen, I've, I've seen the craziest bitterness and all that, everybody thinking well, it's all got to do with what's your own. No, well, that, that baby ain't you. That baby's a whole other person. So I'll, I'll get back off of that right now. But, but as far as Christians and what, well, thank you, this, this body's not mine. And get down to it, it's, it's, a say, it's a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. It's God's. I'm bought with a price. Body, soul, and spirit, I'm his. He's my redeemer. He, the redeemer, he paid my price. I'm not my own. I'm not, I don't have right to, abuse my body we do sometimes I don't have right to do that I don't have a right to just do this do whatever I want to I'm not my own anymore I've joined up on July 22nd 1979 I joined up with God's army 
I got born again, and he saved me, put me in, his, in him and him and me, as I said earlier. The third thought tonight, can you do this? Whatever it is you're contemplating and you're considering, well, is, is it okay for a Christian to do this or not do this? Can you do this knowing that you belong to God? You know, uh, I've at least two different people that I've spent a lot of time with in, in years ago in my life, uh, either somebody I went to church with or somebody that was kind of related to part of the family or something. Uh, I, I'll just give an example of one guy has worked for Coca-Cola for a lot of years. And man, if you was, uh, if you was at a restaurant that, matter of fact, if it was a restaurant that didn't have Coke products, only had Pepsi, I don't even think he would go eat there. But you better don't even don't even try to serve in Pepsi Cola. I mean, they're so loyal. If you work for Coca Cola, and I don't know, I don't know if they made them be that way or they were just loyal to the company. But man, if they work for Coca Cola, you couldn't. I mean, you couldn't chase them fifty miles to give them a Pepsi Cola. But I think about. Now, I'm not. I'm just saying that's the way it is, and I know some folks would die hard to a Ford, die hard to a Chevrolet. I kind of come to the point, I just like it to crank up and get me where I'm going to go, you know, but I do prefer a bow tie in front of it. I'm just trying to say that sometimes we're so careful about representing our, the company that we work for or particular brands, or and don't even get me started on worshiping college football teams and and sports and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with being a fan of something, but a lot, of, a lot of times I think we cross the line in the worship and a lot of that. But what I'm trying to say, we, put, we make all kind of allegiances and uh, alliances, maybe it's a better word there, to, to different things and all that, but the thing that you're considering, you're thinking about, trying to, is it good or not, can you do this knowing that you belong to God, that you're a child of God? I guess I could have just illustrated it simply as a family matter. Would you want your uh, family name to be known around town that, you, that your parents, uh, and I know most of our parents probably in glory by now, some of us in here, but, uh, but, but you know, when you was a child, would you want to protect your mom and daddy's image? Surely, surely Jesus Christ that much more, right? Don't you agree with that? The fact that we're Christians, we ought to be so concerned about, about that and knowing that we belong to God, we ought to, be concerned with that. First Corinthians chapter eight. Okay, now this is where I got maybe made it a little bit confused, and I realized I did Sunday morning in Sunday school. I tried to put too much in an introduction. I went over and and I read Romans uh, chapter fourteen, and I uh, made it a little bit. Got it a little bit too broad, so I apologize for that. So I'm going to simplify it and just stick with all those thoughts on this one point. I'll try to even keep that simple. But 1 Corinthians chapter 8, look down at verse 9. Let's read the remainder of the chapter. It says, But take heed lest by any means that this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see that, see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But whom ye sin so against the brother, I mean, wait a minute, I, I missed that, I'm sorry. But when you sin so against the brother and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wow. So you've, uh, you know, there's a passage in the Bible talking about offending the little ones, and it says he should, he that would offend this little one, be better than a millstone be tied around his neck, he'd be thrown in. And then, you know, and there's two or three different. He goes on and talks about that a little bit. I, I can't think of the address of it right quick. I mean, right off the top of my head. Verse 13 says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, standeth lest I make my brother to offend. Now, I read that over in Romans 14, and it talks about the things we'd eat, whether some, one man may eat it, eat a certain meat. And uh, let's go back to, let's just use pork here for an example. Somebody, we may, we know we have liberty as Christians to eat pork. That was Old Testament under the law. However, it's good advice not to eat a whole lot of pork because it's bad for you. God put all that stuff in the Bible for a reason. 
But as far as the ceremonial and unclean and all that, we're not under that law anymore. I'm, I hope to eat some good ribs over the weekend this coming up weekend, or at least a good barbecue or something. But my, the, the fourth point is the thing you're considering, will it cause a weaker brother to stumble? What about if we had, and I don't know if there's anybody here that's Jewish blood or not, but what if we had somebody, a Jewish family that somebody had witnessed to, let's say Brother Scott saw him at Kroger, and no, let's say Freshway, let's keep it local. Saw him at Freshway and, and uh, maybe gave him a gospel track and that's for new Jesus and, and maybe it led him to the Lord and they, and they got saved and came in. We baptized them and, man, they uh, were Messianic Jews now. They believe in Christ and all that, but all their life but they've been told not to eat pork. Well, it wouldn't be good if we had a fellowship to have ribs of barbecue. I mean, we ought to consider that. And think about that all their life. Maybe give them time to grow a little bit. They wouldn't. Do y'all follow what I'm saying there? Just kind of a simple illustration. I mean, that would all depend on the personal level and all that. But so many things can be done. I think of illustration a long time ago. Uh, I, you know, my background career-wise was heavy truck repair. And I was at a shop that's been closed for 25 or 30 years now. And I was down there, and a guy that was deacon at the church I went to when I was a teenager well, this is how long ago I was a teenager. Wow, that's been a long time ago. And the wheels were wood. You know, but uh, anyway, I was at this shop, and this man was a deacon. I mean, I thought he was a, and, I mean, to me, he was a, somebody I looked up to, you know. And he, he worked at this shop, and uh, somebody else had come in there, and you know how guys always carrying on, popping each other grease rags, and all that stuff. Well, the guy said something kind of smart alecky playing with this guy. I was talking to this deacon, and this guy just bigger than anything. I, I'll just leave this, did like a double hand gesture. I'll just leave it at that. Bigger than anything right there in front of me. And I thought, I mean, it, just, it broke my heart. I thought, this guy's a deacon at our church, and this guy, I'd, I mean, I mean, I, you know, and that's maybe not the worst thing a person could do, but for me, man, a teenage boy, young Christian, man, it just kind of, it really, well, I remember it plain as day to day. And it really, I love that man. I love him until the day he died. I still, I was, you know, when I was away from that church. I mean, I wasn't in that church a lot longer after that and all, but I still, had, I still saw that man time to time and, and all you know, and I still respect him as, as a brother and everything. But man, that day he just let me down so much. It just kind of like, should we do that? Should the, is that okay? Who cares? My deacon doing that? Is that all right for me? And I'm not passing it off on deacons. I could put that test to anybody in the church from, you know, the, the whatever position. We're not in levels in that manner. We ought to all walk walk in holiness and walk pleasing to the Lord. But that thing that you're considering doing, would it cause a weaker brother to stumble? Um, you may, for a side note, go back and read Romans 14. It goes in a little bit more detail of some different areas and, and all. But basically the conclusion back there was whether you eat this thing to please the Lord or you don't eat it to please the Lord or whether you celebrate a certain day to please the Lord or you don't to celebrate it. Some, some people uh, do something to to celebrate to, in, a, in thinking they're doing it for honoring the Lord and another person may not do that thing to honor the Lord and there's some things that are that way. Days, the meats, and different things is another category mentioned back there. Um, but the bottom line is, is whatever you do, do it to do it in, as far as the meat goes. Be thankful for the meat and give God praise and thanks for the meat and eat it for him, but not to cause a younger brother or sister in Christ to stumble whatever the case might be. Chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, well, this one right here, I could just read the verse and go on to the next point, but you know I'm not going to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. This thing that you're considering, that you, that you, there's just not a Bible verse that says it. This one right here pretty much says it. If you got a little bit of um, spiritual backbone to you and spiritual knowledge. First Corinthians ten thirty one. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
Well, that, that gets a lot said right there. And simply, out, as a matter of fact, simply, does it glorify God? Could you, could you, whatever it is, could you, if it's a cup or something, could you lift a cup up to the heavens and say, well, glory to God? If it's something you're talking about eating or wearing, if it's an outfit, could you hold, take the hanger off the rack and hold it up and say, well, glory to God? Well, that's um, pretty, pretty tough right there. You know, we ought to be error signs. You know, I, I still like the old cartoons when we had the grandchildren here last week. Uh, I wanted to let them watch the old, uh, the remake of the movie of the Little Rascals, and we did one night, the one that was made probably in the 90s or something, um, if y'all know what I'm talking about, the one. But, but I said, before they do that, I got to show them the real stuff. So I went in there, and uh, whatever thing it is on the TV, you know, I went to it and found it where they got the old classic Little Rascals, and I showed them some of them real old, genuine Little Rascals. But I, I love it, stuff like that, with having a race. I had to stop and think why I told you all that. But, when they, you know, and they had the go-kart race and the little rascals. But anyway, uh, I like, you know, in the old cartoons, it'd be uh, Wiley Cody. It'd be after the road runner or something. And ro ro the road runner would go up, and you see a little arrow sign that said, turn this way. And he'd go over, and he'd turn the arrow that way. And he'd run through there and run off a cliff. You know what I mean? It was just it happened to seem like every episode on some kind of cartoon that was always going on. But, you know, our, we ought to be road signs. We ought to be arrows that point people to Christ with our life. We ought to glorify God in all that we do. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall, be changed, shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Uh, the blessed hope, the catching away of the bride, the rapture of the church. Well, that's, that's our hope, man. We're, we're looking for that day. Whether it'll happen in mine in your lifetime, I don't know. I believe so. Paul did too. But the fact that he ain't come yet, don't be a scoffing and a mocking, he's coming. And when he comes, instantaneously, we'll take that heavenly flight. You can argue about whether we'll knock a hole in the roof or whether we'll go through it like a ghost. I ain't argue with it. I don't care. I know All I know is I'm going beyond that roof. You know, all the little details like that don't matter, but I believe it's going to be in the, in the twinkling of the eye, and that's pretty quick. That's the glisten of a light beam off the eye. Light's 186,000 feet per second, miles per second light electricity, as they say. I like to know the guy that put a speedometer on it. But I'm just trying to say immediately when the trump of God sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first. And I don't know if it's a split, the, the time difference between the two, but it ain't going to be two or three days to walk around and wonder what happened. They're going first, and we're going out of here too. Those song, I like that song that me and my wife sing sometimes, an ordinary day. So there'll be no time to change you, no time to mend your ways. Suddenly the Lord shall come again. When he comes, he's not going to say, oh, wait a minute, God, I'm doing something I ought not to be doing. Give me a minute, hold on a second. You know, when kids, kids can say, give me a minute, hold on a minute. Well, I guess his husband's pretty bad about that too. You take his trash out, give me a minute. Never mind, it's knocking a hole in the sheetrock. Then got a trash mountain in there. I'll get to it. You don't have to remind me every month. The question is, would you want to be caught doing this thing you're considering doing? Would you want to be caught doing it when the Lord comes? Man, that's shameful to think about. You know where we're going immediately after the Lord comes? Well, that's the next point. I think about when a child, if you've raised children, you walk in a room, they're quiet, and you walk in a room in their Maybe got a cookie that got snuck before lunch and they're in there eating it. When you walk in the room, they put that cookie behind their back or something. 
whatever that thing is, is it something that the, when the rapture takes place, you'd feel like you need to stop and tell God to hold his eternal glory just a second for you to put away that thing? Well, I think that's a pretty good test, isn't it? Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the last Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. The Bible says, For we must all appear before the judge. Now it says all, not all mankind, but all that is written to Christians in the church at Corinth. We as Christians must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And then we know the I believe the word of God will be the judge. The things that are done for wrong motives and for our own glory and for our own good and things like and such as that are things we ought not have done. But 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 anyway, the mainly the thought of, of the judgment seat of Christ is the things we've done for His glory, the works we've done, whatever we've done. If it was for our glory and the motives were right, we're, there's rewards. We know there's five different rewards for it. That's another message. But the things that was maybe a uh, uh, I say a preacher, for example, is preaching this all about money and all about himself, and he's just trying to make a name for himself and all that, served God for 60 years and all that, and boy, expecting to be just heavily rewarded because he was such a good preacher and such a good pastor and all such as that, and the judgment seat of Christ would be sad thinking not even getting that reward for that, all that year and, and wasted reward. Now, there's five different rewards, some that, Everybody can get some that only certain ones can get. As I said, that's a whole other message, but at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in case anybody doesn't understand, when I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ, we'll stand before Jesus Christ, and that'll be our every knee of bow time for the child of God, for the saved. Nobody's leaving there going to hell. You're just going there with or without, without rewards, and those rewards will be ultimately that we'll cast at Jesus' feet and for all eternity in heaven. It ain't about us. It's all about Jesus. But the great white throne judgment, if you're saved, you won't go there. We'll witness it, but we won't go there. That's the lost. The lost dead, the lost alive at that time will be brought up before Jesus, stand there. They'll bow their head, I mean bow before him, acknowledge him as the king of glory, as Jesus Christ, the son of God, ever high. I'm not sure, I'm sure what they'll say, but they'll acknowledge he is the Savior that they rejected right before they cast off the eternal lake of fire. But for the child of God, you know, a lot of times you hear a lot of things like, man, we're building, you know, a lot of songs. No, nothing, I'm not saying anything's wrong with this, but things like, boy, we're building up us, all these rewards, these uh, uh, things, we're gonna, crowns, the words that the Bible used, the five crowns, that we're going to be casting his feet and all that and, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a lot more embarrassing and shameful for most of us than glorious for us. I, I mean, I think about things that, you know, there's a little phrase, you have your reward. And it's talked about different ones that do things for others to see. And the principle being that you've got your, the others seeing it, that's your reward but the thing done that others don't see, but it's done simply for the glory of God, that's the things that will be rewarded. Harold Tab that I studied under in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, M.H. Tab, he's got a old saying, and you may have heard this from preachers, a lot of, I mean from other people, your grandparents, your grandma may have told you this. So there's going to be three surprises in heaven. And I believe in a no-so salvation. I believe y'all, if you're saved, y'all know you're saved. The Bible teaches that. But, but the one surprise is, is people that ain't there that you thought would be there. The second was that people that you thought was there that ain't there, that I say the same thing twice, people that's there that you didn't think was there because they ain't because you, the way you judge them because they're saved or not. And then ultimately, as much as I believe in a no-so salvation, when we see him in all his glory, boy, it's going to be a surprise like, Wow. It's really here. We're really there. Uh, 
the judgment seat of Christ. Um, you know, another thing I'm going to quote MH Tab, and you've probably heard a lot of other people say this, is we all live every day of our life with the judgment seat of Christ in our mind. But think about the thing that you're considering. Is it right? Is it wrong? Well, the Bible don't say I can't do it. But there might be 10,000 principles in the Bible that says y'all not to. But that thing that you're considering, whatever it is, go, do, partake of, whatever it might be, is it something that you want to be brought up at the judgment seat of Christ? I'll just go back through these real, real quickly. Number one, can you do this knowing that the Holy Ghost lives in you? Number two, can you do this knowing that you belong to God? Number three, will this cause a weaker brother to stumble? Number four, five, does it glorify God? Number six, would you want to be caught doing it when the Lord comes? Number th seven, and lastly, how would you feel facing this and the consequences of it at the judgment seat of Christ? I'd ask you three questions in closing. Number one, do you need to come in? Are you saved? Do you know Christ? Is he knocking on your heart's door? Do you need to let him in? Do you need, do you need to come into Jesus? What I'm saying, do you need to get saved tonight? Do you know him as your savior? Uh, man, the wicked of this world and things going on, I just don't believe we got much longer on this old earth. Number two, do you need to come away? Meaning, Whatever the thing is you're considering, maybe something that you need to put to this test and it clearly would fail this test. Trust the Lord to give you strength with it. Number three, simply, we'll have just a minute of silence. And I'll ask Brother Bob in just a minute to close in a word of prayer from this part of service. But do you need to, number one, come in? Do you need to, two, come away? Number three, do you need to come down? It's something you need to bring to this altar tonight. Just ask God to help you with, guide you, give you strength with. What do you need to do tonight? Let's just take a minute and just close our eyes for a minute and uh, just pray and ask God to help you and guide us. Brother Bob, as you see fit in just a minute, if you would, dismiss us from this part of service.